Today we have with us three incredibly amazing women who will be speaking to us about their experiences as trailblazing entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs in their own right. So firstly, we have CEO and founder of Arjun Associates and Associar LCC, Betty Mineta. Next, we have NBA holder and accountant of Mew and Company, Aaron Mew. And lastly, but most, ne- most definitely not the least, we have experienced senior strategy and operational executive, Praveena Raghavan. Next, we're going to hand it off to our amazing panelists, starting with Praveena. The floor is yours. Please tell us about your story. Well, thank you. I want to thank uh, Professor Sherrick and the other panelists. I'm excited to hear your stories and uh, also to you, Belan and uh, Faith, for doing this. And uh, I'm just excited to be here. Uh, I am an entrepreneur, I guess. That's what uh, Susan, Professor Sherrick keeps telling me. But uh, my career started uh, uh, oh so many years ago at uh, Penn State. I know that's not Seton Hall, but uh, Penn State. I graduated from Penn State uh, as a finance major and uh, started my career at AT AT&T. And I remember I was about a year into my job. I met the CFO of the company and I said, hi, I'd really like to get into this uh, executive management uh, leadership program you have. And I need a recommendation from you. And I just remember him looking at me like, who are you and why are you asking that? I'm like, great question. So when can I get 15 minutes on your uh, on your calendar? so that I can get into this program. And uh, I was lucky enough to get into a two year program with AT&T, which really jump-started my career because it gave me the confidence to realize that if you don't ask for what you want, no matter what people are telling you, especially when you look different, uh, you may not get it. And so that was a a really interesting learning experience. And now that I sit back here, I'm like, wow, I didn't know I had the confidence to do that because as you get a little older, you start uh, realizing your risk tolerance changes, but things that you can do when you're young to be a trailblazer are amazing. So I uh, took that career. Uh, I started my own small business. I was a strategic development executive for tech firms in Europe and Asia. I I spoke fluent fluent French, so I decided to go to Europe and do mergers and acquisitions deals. I came back to the United States, started my own company. And then um, when I came back to the US, I found out the investment bankers, you might not know this, are a dime a dozen in New York City and uh, New Jersey. And so my company was like, huh, what do you do? Uh, so I took another risk and I became uh, a move to MTV Networks. You may have heard of them. They are a little small uh, company, media company. And I did uh, deals. I uh, did what I do best, which is negotiate. So I did deals for uh, the 23 channels they had uh, and found out that I'm not good at marketing, not my forte, but I'm really good at finance, so, which is my forte, and uh, decided to give back and join the government. And that's where people go, Oh, how'd you do that? How did that work out for you? I am one of the success stories of actually applying to usajobs.gov and got a job. Uh, I ran the SBA's uh, New York City district office, which does like a billion dollars in loans. Uh, And uh, then from there, I went to work at our headquarters down in D.C. to run one of the largest private equity uh, portfolios for the government. And then I became the deputy secretary of commerce's uh, senior advisor. So I did everything from figuring out how to talk about whales, which are a real problem, I found out. Uh, my first meeting when they said we have a whale of a problem, I said, yep, a lot of big problems, we'll solve it. They're like, no, we have whale problems, like they're actual problems with the whales. So I was like, okay, good to know. Uh, needless to say, I'm not a marine biologist, so not not one of my four days. Uh, to figuring out the census, which is so important that we just finished, uh, to figuring out economic development. So I did that for several years. And uh, when I thought I'd go back into the private sector, I realized I really loved giving back. Uh, My sister, who's a civil rights attorney, told me once, you could help 20 to 30 companies or you could help 20 to 30,000 people. What would you rather do? And that's when I realized that I love public service because of the ability to work with entrepreneurs and make their dreams happen um, by realizing that uh, being inside an establishment when they say, let's make a program look like this, going, but are you really taking in consideration all the different people who need to access that program? They may not look what you think they look like. How do we uh, make programs develop so that businesses can actually, and people can actually get the support as they don't all look the same as we all know. Uh, so I've been doing that. I moved back to the great state of New York. I know it's not Seton Hall again, 
but uh, I am a, I, I, I am the head of uh, entrepreneur entrepreneurship and technology development and uh, all the programs that the great state of New York does for small businesses. And I have 30 programs underneath me. I've got four great direct reports. And what we really do is build programs to help uh, what we call filling in the gap. So a lot of the money that we push out into the market is to hit minority and women businesses. We have goals for that. Uh, and also really structure and move industries. We launched a loan fund program in the middle of the pandemic when all the businesses weren't really small micro businesses weren't getting the federal PPP uh, and other items. And what we did is like, let's go to the banks with the power of the state and say, give me money at 2%. I'm going to give loans out at 3%. You guys aren't going to make that much, but you'll get your credit with your auditors. We'll uh, back it with any losses because we really believe these are entrepreneurs and we've done 86 million out of a hundred million dollar fund and uh, what the stat that impresses me the most is that 80 80 percent of these loans have gone to women and minority this means these are these are these are businesses that are paying back their loans at a hundred thousand dollars and know how to keep their businesses right in the middle of one of the you know a, a altering pandemic and so that's my journey is to try to really help that and I based on a lot of the stuff that I learned being in the private industry, uh, taking risks, but realizing that sometimes being a part of the system to create a voice is just as hard as being outside the system, but we need to work together to get there. Um, and uh, Susan knows that I'm going to be leaving the great state of New York and going back to the federal government in a few months uh, to build the manufacturing sector here in, in the United States, uh, looking at small media manufacturers and helping them grow as well. Because with this pandemic, we've realized that we need to rethink how we look at small businesses because they truly are the drivers of our economy. Even the big guys know that the supply chain and everything we do is important. So that was my journey in 10 minutes or less. So uh, I want to thank you guys for having me here. And I'm looking forward to the questions and hearing about the amazing things from Betty and Aaron as well. Thank you so much, Praveena. That was amazing. So um, next, we're going to jump to Erin. Um, would you? Are you ready? <laughs> yeah. Hey. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, OK, cool. So um, Praveena, that was such a great intro. Um, I don't know how I'm going to live up to that, but it's really cool meeting you because uh, you work for the SBA and you helped a lot of small businesses. And because I work in tax, I helped a lot of these small businesses prepare their financial statements and forms and come up to speed so they could present stuff for the SBA to obtain these loans. So um, people are always like, oh, tax season's over. Are you busy? I'm like, yes, we're helping all these small businesses get the money they need to employ others, right? We have to keep the system going. We need people to put food on the table. We have jobs to create and keep like employed, right? But it's really cool that um, just tonight, for two spectrums of what was going on. So thanks for what you do, because you know without the funding from the SBA, a lot of people, I don't know how they'd be doing right now. So back to how I got into tax, uh, I guess my story is a little bit different. I followed my dad's footsteps. I even went to Seton Hall like my dad. A lot of my family members went there, so I'm one of the legacy kids from Seton Hall. My dad went there to my uncle's. I met my husband there, my cousin and my uncle also met their wives at Seton Hall. So we really love Seton Hall. <laughs> Go Pirates. So they were a little, they were proud of me, but a little disappointed when I decided to go to Syracuse to get my MBA. But, you know, higher education, if that's uh, an opportunity that you um, can have and achieve, I think you should take it because we're all in it together and you really need to push the boundaries. Like Praveena mentioned before, as a minority and as a woman, if you don't ask, a lot of times you don't get it. People will overlook you because of how you look. Maybe you have a little bit of an accent. Um, they're not, you're not the candidate that they thought you would be. So if there's something that you know you deserve to have and you're qualified, you're intelligent, you ask for it. And don't ever be ashamed to ask for what you want and take take an opportunity because someone else might not have those opportunities that you do. And for myself, knowing that I've been super fortunate because of my family business and the things that I've been provided, I felt that it would be an injustice if I didn't ask and take more whenever uh, opportunity presented itself. 
So when I was able to go to my top pick for my MBA, I took and took it and went. Um, I worked full time and, you know, part of my encouragement to start my MBA was because some of my parents' employees didn't like working with the boss's child. They thought like, oh, who are you? You just showed up. You probably don't know anything. Like, you're just here because mommy and daddy are here. And then as they saw me progress in my accounting career, they're like, oh, you're still here. Why are you still here? And that used to bother me, but I have the right to be there. And I'm talented. I work hard. And when you know those things about yourself, um, you can't let someone push you around. And once they found out I was pursuing my MBA and I was still working, it bothered some people because they're like, oh, you're serious. And now you're achieving more than I did. And now even though I have more work experience, now you out-educate me. And being a woman in business and a minority too, sometimes you make other people uncomfortable and you have to be okay with it because we take those chances so that other people like ourselves can have it easier in the future. And so um, I guess every choice that I've taken, like going into fashion before I went to accounting, I took roles that were a little out of the cookie cutter mold for like an Asian American. And as a first generation in America, um, I felt like I had to take these chances because my parents didn't have them or my other relatives. And hopefully, like, when my family, we all start having kids, we make it easier for them. So, you know, being able to live my childhood dream, to dabble in New York Fashion Week for a few seasons, I managed a flagship, I got to style different celebrities, and then I took a drastically different uh, turn, and now I crunch numbers all day. But... At the end of the day, you have to pick things that make you happy and feel fulfilling. So at the time when I was in fashion, it was where I needed to be. And I gained a lot of um, experience that helped me deal with high stress situations. And it translated into going to tax season and dealing with people that don't know how to manage their funds. Maybe they can't fund their business. Maybe they're worried about paying their employees. And we have to be that calm force to know how to help them like fix it and tell them it's okay and show them possible solutions to continue their dream, right? So by living part of my dream, I get to help others. And I think that's really rewarding. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of me in a nutshell. So <laughs> Um, thank you for having me, and I guess maybe on to Betty now. Thank you, and uh, amazing stories, ladies. And Provina, like you, my journey started at, um, well, it wasn't AT&T at the time, it was Western Electric, um, which made the phones, uh, and probably a lot of you don't, don't even know uh, the, rotary, the old rotary phones, but um, so I worked for Western Electric, and um, started my career out as a secretary and I worked my way up uh, going to school at night, getting my uh, undergrad in at Rutgers uh, with accounting and marketing major and then Seton Hall for my international uh, MSIB, Masters of International Business. Um, so um, I did that all at night, it took forever, uh, but uh, it really gave me a great opportunity to expand uh, within AT&T. So worked my way up. Um, spent some, uh, I had international jobs, that's why I took the MSIB. Uh, I had the Middle East and Africa sales and sales support, and then later on I had um, the uh, Caribbean and Latin America region. So that gave me uh, a good glimpse at the international world and uh, got to travel in a lot of different places. Um, and then uh, in 98 I decided to leave uh, AT&T, at that time it was um, well, it was AT&T and then my boss retired. I went to Network Systems or Lucent at the time, uh, left Lucent and started my business back in 98. And so um, so when you look at, um, you know, starting your own business, it was really highly telecom related. Um, and Praveena, just as you said, uh, we're a minority woman owned business. Um, I'm Hispanic. I was born in Argentina. So 
Um, I understand the challenges that women of color have these days, and that's why I also belong to the National Minority Supplier Development Council, the Women's Business Council, and I'm on the board of the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So we do a lot of work um, to uh, make sure that there's equity and inclusion in everything, because corporations, frankly, are not living up to what they said they were going to do. And I know in the government, you guys have, uh, we do have several contracts in New York uh, with the economic development with MTA. Uh, we also have contracts with DCAS. So um, that's, uh, and it was all through the economic development organization that started some of these programs. Um, the, uh, the, the thing that I found through my journey is being in telco uh, and in technology is very difficult, especially as a Hispanic woman or as, as a woman period. Uh, when I started my company back in 98, there weren't that many women uh, that did uh, what I did, right? So I started out more in the supply chain logistics and value-added reselling. And then later on uh, in 2012, we developed, uh, took our, we, I started seeing, because I'm always looking at ahead of what's happening. And I saw that you couldn't sustain a business doing the same old thing. So I got into engineering installation of mobility. So we do distributed antennas, uh, small cells, Wi-Fi, 5G. And um, in 2017, we saw that sustainability started uh, becoming a little more aggressive. And so now we're doing artificial intelligence uh, for uh, and to help companies reduce their energy. Uh, we're doing, uh, we're getting into and, and working with a company in Germany uh, to do uh, the uh, electric vehicle chargers, which is going to be very big as as you know, in Europe by 2030, uh, they will not be allowed to have combustible engines, so everything will be electrified. And so I think that the U.S. is going that way. And so we see a lot of opportunity. So one of the things that I do is you have to be visionary. You have to be able to do your homework, see what's happening, and, and kind of pursue those opportunities. And so um, that's uh, what we're doing today. And I'm just going to tell you that I'm going to be popping in and out only because I hear my grandson screaming uh, downstairs and he's five months old. So pretty soon he'll be going to bed. But um, I did want to at least uh, give you a little glimpse as to my journey. And uh, I look forward to hearing more uh, and doing some of the questions and answers. So thank you. Just Betty, so you know, I'm a Lucent alumni too. I started oh, with Network are. Systems. <laughs> yep, that's where I started. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, were you in New Jersey? Yep, I was in Marstown, New Jersey. <laughs> okay, I was in, um, I was all over. I started in Newark and yep. uh, then Marstown and then uh, Madison Avenue. And the last gig was uh, Warren, New Jersey. That's awesome. That's funny when you said Lucent. Yep, that's where I started my career too. <laughs> now it's Nokia. Um, thank you guys so much for those great introductions. Um, thank you also for touching on the topics as it related to um, diversity and equity. We'll definitely get into that later in the talk. Um, so let's just hop into the questions or as I like to call them conversation starters. So um, I know all of you guys gave a insight in your journey and I think a connection between every one of you is that you have experience in a wide range, range of industries. So how did you find your focus in where you are? Uh, are you directing it to anybody? Or? Yes, to anyone. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, obviously my focus, um, because I had 20 plus years experience uh, at at and I think that that kind of um, kind of guided me to um, to technology. And of course, um, you know, what you do is you constantly evolve. And so um, that's where I found it. And, and again, I think working for a corporation for 20 years really gives you a, a good uh, rounded uh, um, capabilities, right? Because um, like I said, I started out as a secretary and then I worked in HR and then I worked in the Middle East and, Af and, um, and Cala doing bids and proposals, uh, supplier diversity, um, we did uh, what well, was called affirmative action at that time. Uh, we did, I did um, quality. So we, when, you know, I dabbled in a lot of different things as a director. And so uh, I think that really gave me a good rounded uh, capability when I launched my company, because, you know, when you launch your company, you are a solopreneur, 
right? I did the, the, the Xerox machine, I did my bids, I did the quoting, I did the contracts, I answered the phones, I fixed everything, you know, developed my own website. So, um, and then until you're able to, uh, you know, to hire people, you really, that's, you're the chief of everything officer, CEO, chief of everything officer. Um, uh, I'll go next. I, uh, to be honest, I have no idea how I found my focus. Uh, this is uh, interesting when I saw the question, uh, because my focus, uh, I've done a lot of different industries, but what I'm good at, and that's always been, is uh, I'm a finance geek, so I love spreadsheets and data, so people don't realize that. You <laughs> see, people don't realize they're like, oh yeah, and I'm like, so if you give me data, I'll figure out, I'll figure out how a solution to the problem, and that's when I realized that that skill set, I think this happens to a lot of people, whatever you're good at, you think everybody's got it. So then, you know, when you do all these Meyer Briggs and all these like strengths and weaknesses, you're like, oh, I'm not good at this. But we spend more time looking at what we're not good at than what we are. And I realized, hey, if you give me data and numbers, I'm going to figure out a solution because numbers don't lie. And that's like, I know it sounds funny, but I'm like, numbers cannot lie. And so, um, you know, I went from investment banking to starting my own company, doing a lot of stuff. All the, the theme in there is always numbers. Like I'm good at numbers. And so even now when people give me solutions, I'm like, what's the data? And I'm not, and, and people look at me like, oh, well, the data, I'm like, it tells you a lot more than you're thinking um, if you ask the right questions. And so the path that I've always said is I do, one of the best books I read is like, what is your strengths? Now do it. And everybody laughed at me and I'm like, no, they're right. We spend 80% of our time trying to, you know, look at your weaknesses and like once you start knowing what your strengths are and say hey i'm weak in these areas that's why i hire people who are good in them because we can make a good team you can do what you do well and so like even now one of the one of the best uh, one of the best experiences i've had is we just lost a program in the government mind you i work for the state government in 63 days and everybody's like that's impossible and i'm like it isn't when you have a good team because i know what i'm good at and they know what they're good at we just went through it and it was and i always say data doesn't lie so if i've got the data i can convince you somehow to come to this side so i think it's knowing what you're good at and then doing it because i think when we all focus on the other stuff that's when people start getting dragged down yeah, I 100% agree because I'm also a spreadsheet geek, especially you know being in accounting. Like in grad school, I was always picked to do all the financials. I'm like, can I try something else? They're like, no, this is for you. I mean, people even see my vacation spreadsheets and they'll know. They're like, you must be in accounting. I'm like, yes, it's color coded and it's beautiful. <laughs> but in all seriousness, like I think that knowing what you gravitate towards really helps you focus on finding your voice at work in your career and i think that certain personality types you do gravitate certain things so it's just like in accounting everyone says like oh i'm surprised you like to talk so much i'm surprised you like color and stuff like that because we have a stereotype that we're just desk monkeys and all we do is like type away and you know i think you do have to have certain traits like you have have a affinity towards numbers and organization that will certainly help you in like my field but it's okay to be a little different as long as you always remember what your strengths are so it's like you could have fun but if you're an accountant make sure you still know how to do addition <laughs> um yeah so i think um just staying focused on what you're good at but also don't be afraid to have some fun and it'll take you far. Thank you so much. Those are really amazing answers. I especially love that you really focused on, you know, finding what it is you're good at and just double downing on that instead of looking at what everyone else can do better than you. So for the next question, I think you, you kind of all like touched on this a bit. But um, just take it a little further. How did you develop, you know, the confidence that you have today when you were starting out? And what do you recommend that students start doing in their academics and in their um, professional lives to start developing their confidence? Well, I'll start again. <laughs> um, uh, so as we said, you know, um, a lot of it comes from uh, the work that you do. Uh, like, for example, when I came back from maternity leave at AT&T, 
my boss tells me, um, you know, my job was eliminated or it was filled with someone else. And that's when they said, you're going to run the um, you know, the Egypt country desk, uh, you know, the Caribbean, I mean, uh, the Middle East and Africa. And I was like, OK, I don't know the language. I mean, I'm Spanish. I can speak Spanish. But they gave me something that I was not uh, equipped to do. But I said, yes, I said, yes, I'll do it um, because I knew that. Um, I had the skills. Uh, I was, you know, I, I ran different businesses on the side when when I was even working at AT and T. So I knew that I could do a lot of different things, and I figured I'll just learn it, right? Uh, I think all too often we as women uh, kind of sit back and say, no, I, I don't think I have the skills. But uh, you know, as as we mentioned earlier, you know what you're good at, and and you focus on that. And as a matter of fact. Um, you know, the, the folks that are in, in Cairo today uh, are still my friends because they were part of AT&T and now they're some of them are uh, with Nokia. So um, I think that the you know, you, you develop the confidence because you know that you're good at, at stuff. And and as uh, we mentioned earlier, um, you know, the, the thing is uh, finding what you're good at and, and focus on that versus the things that you may not be good at. Right. Um, and, and the other thing I, I think is, uh, you know, um, you need to learn and keep learning because nothing stays the same, right? In technology, nothing stayed the same. So uh, I had to learn new things. And so uh, I think just the ability of uh, being able to maneuver around uh, the company like I did uh, at AT&T. And then when I, when I started my, when I launched my company back in 98, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to survive, but I, you know, you, you start saying, yes, I can. And you, you find that encouragement inside and then going to organizations like the Women's Council, you find other women that could be your coach, right? Um, because we kind of lift each other up and support each other because then you find that you're not alone. So I think um, doing a little bit of uh, that kind of uh, networking really helps a lot. Uh, I guess I'll go next. Um, so as I mentioned before, I was very fortunate to grow up in a very supportive family. And we have a lot of entrepreneurs from like my extended family and my parents. So they're always really encouraging uh, for me to try new things and explore and push my limits. So I used to be pretty self-conscious that I also went to Seton Hall like a lot of my family because I didn't want to be viewed as the same as my other family members. I wanted to be different. Maybe that's because I'm an only child. Like I'm very, I have a very strong sense of like self-identity, but I realized at some point that regardless of what you're doing, like if you're a student or if you're working, um, you get what you put into it. And so I found myself at this wonderful university at Seton Hall and I was like, how can I get more, like I want a different experience than my dad or my uncle or my, my husband or a lot of my friends. So whenever there was an opportunity for like study abroad, I went to Cairo with Dr. Abdullah, like one of my accounting professors. I went to Italy for a week with Professor McCarthy. I spent a summer in Paris with Dr. Mullenhall and I spent um, like a few weeks in China with Dr. Yin. And it was a great way for me to learn about myself when you're put out of your comfort zone, but also to meet other people that challenge you, like different peers and also your professors and deans. And um, it really gave me a base for trying different things and really finding where I fit in in the world of business and entrepreneurship because a lot of these um, overseas programs for Seton Hall, they really have you meet with different local businesses. Like when I was in Cairo, we even got to tour the Cairo Stock Exchange. So like in your early 20s, that's pretty cool, you know? Um, you get to see really interesting facets. Like in China, I got to go to a factory. Um, in Italy, I got to see shoes made by hand. And I think all of these things really help you become who you are by just being exposed to it, also being open to wanting to learn and see these things. 
And um, I mentioned before that I had some of my ex coworkers be uncomfortable with me advancing my education because it made them uncomfortable. But for myself, I find that whenever I'm uncomfortable, that's when I find the most confidence because I push myself not to feel uncomfortable anymore. So when you stop feeling uncomfortable, it's a good indicator that you probably need some change in your life. So right now I'm good because I just finished my MBA, but I'm going to start feeling uncomfortable soon. And then I'm going to have to look for the next thing to move on to. Um, I just want Aaron to know I also color code my vacation spreadsheets, so you're not the only one. And I have everybody has color coded uh, pamphlets and I give them them before the airport and then I have to check in. So don't worry, you're not the only one. Um, but, I, you know, we're I think the same. <laughs> we're same. I think this was actually a great panel. I'm like, I love everybody's answers. Um, I, I will tell you when I was younger, I don't have the same confidence that I do now. And a lot of it is what you, you learn through experience. And I think that's the one thing. Um, so I, uh, I have a very loving supporting family. Uh, I remember the day I told my parents I wanted to go into finance. My grandmother started weeping. Uh, she said, why aren't you going to be a doctor? Are you not smart? Um, that was her, you know, because that was what every Indian kid does. We all become doctors. Um, and I was like, no, no, I really want to do this thing called finance. Everyone was just like, accounting, we understand. Finance just sounds like some made up thing that you decided to do. And I'm like, no, no, it's a legitimate career. Um, and I took the risk and I mean, obviously it paid off and my grandmother's very happy now and uh, it's all good. But there was, you know, the funnier story is that my sister decided to become a journalist and my, my grandmother asked my mother, two in the same family, two, two girls who don't know. <laughs> and my mom's like, no, but I think um, some of it, what I didn't realize when I was younger is that I was dealing with experiences to make me change, right? And it's what Aaron was saying perfectly. If you feel too comfortable, you start after questioning, why are you so comfortable? Because you're probably falling into the mold that everybody's asking you to be in. And now I tell people, I'm like, you, what you see is what you get. Like if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm happy, angry, you'll know because I don't have to be artificial anymore because it's I'm not fitting anyone's role. I'm fitting who I am. And I think that was, you know, it took a while to realize that we're told to be in a role and how do you move out of that to have your own voice and and it's that experience of pushing yourself and going hey i did that i was able to do that and you know there are people who do marathons and i'm always impressed by them because i'm like i don't have the stamina to do 26 miles but they trained for that right they they push themselves out of and mine is about experiences and i will tell you traveling was a great way to do that because when you find yourself in a foreign country where no one speaks your language and you can survive you start realizing that you probably have a lot more skill sets than you than you, than you thought you did. I love that, Pravina. Uh, I happened to be in Russia and uh, we were at a place and nobody spoke English. And so they gave me a menu all in Russian. And so I started making cow, you know, like moo, like <laughs> they would point to stuff and we were cracking up. But uh, you're, you're so right. That's a great, great uh, analogy. Yeah, I really love what you guys all got at in terms of um, finding things that make you uncomfortable and taking risk and um, getting out of your comfort zone. Um, those were all great insights. And moving on to our next question. So being that we are highlighting women this week and that it is Women Entrepreneurship Week, you guys have already mentioned it already a little bit, but can you just... Tell us about your, how your gender may have affected your journey. Um, any insights you may have on that? I, I don't think it's ever, ever affected my journey ever. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You're both all looking at me like, is she crazy? No. Um, I, uh, I'm, uh, you can't see because I'm sitting I'm a five foot nine Indian woman. So I have always my entire life been the either in the back row because, you know, the, the, all the school photos until the boys caught up in high school. Um, I've always been different. And so uh, I always laugh, you know, I've been a woman uh, all my life and people, that's the first thing they go, oh, you're a five foot nine Indian lady. I'm like, yeah, I, I get that. I know that. Um, and I started to embrace it. Like, I think, you know, I started, uh, well, there used to be a very set uniform. When you graduated college, they told you, you got to wear a skirt of a certain length. It's got to be in blue or, you know, pinstripe. Don't go too many bold colors. 
make sure it's white. Like they, that, that, you know, that was the precursor of starting to go there. Um, I started going into rooms and of course I'm the only woman in most of the rooms and all of a sudden they always thought I was the assistant and said, go get me coffee. And, uh, I was doing deals at 25 for at and and I'm like, I'm not the person who's getting you coffee. I'm the person who's supposed to sign the, the deal sheet. And, uh, that's when I realized it's okay to embrace that you're a woman because guess what? They know that. Um, and I started wearing like pink suits and, you know, purple suits and people are like, well, you get the and I said, what's the difference? You already know I'm a lady. I might as well dress what I want to dress and start working that way. Um, and I will tell you, I get the same thing. Like, I don't understand you. You seem a little emotional. And whenever I'm very abrupt and you know, I do a lot of business, oh, you, you know, sometimes you come off mean. And I'm like, is it mean or is it that I'm just very firm? Like, and so I think you've got to get used to being a woman in business. You're going to hear your everything, but the you're going to hear everything that you're not right. You're this, you're that. But the reality is if you know who you are and you're doing what's right to get the job done, you've got to go in there. And there were times when, you know, I, I have this strict rule of never crying at work because the minute you cry, they're like, Oh, you know, they told you she was weak. And you're like, I'm not weak. You just called me really nasty things. No one would sit there and just say, yeah, thanks. Give me more. But I also realize you have to push back. And that's one thing that women don't get told how to push back. Well, um, I get a lot of times, I know Aaron said, people go, oh, I don't understand you. And I'm like, well, I have several degrees and speak five different languages. If you want me to do it in another language, I'm happy. Or do you just not like the concept that I've given you, right? Because it's they're saying it to make me feel like, oh, you don't understand? Let me help you. So I think a lot of it is you've got to know yourself, but it's okay to push back. Because if you don't, you're falling again into that comfort zone to make yourself uh, feel good but sometimes being nice isn't always what you need to do and i think women get told from a little age be a good girl sit correctly don't cry don't make you know don't make waves and it you don't realize until later on that that's how you're trained and i started realizing that now when i have a um, younger generation of women coming and talking to me i'm like wow you're so brave to do that i would have never done that in my 20s and i realized cuz i had been programmed to not do anything not stay out of my box because you get penalized for that. And the reality is you don't. You just have to be able to uh, deal with some of the nastiness that might come with it. <laughs> yeah, I think in my culture, like Chinese culture, um, they don't make it, um, they make it very obvious that they prefer men over women. So like even my own grandmother, she was like, oh, um, I love you, but don't you want a little brother? It was always like, you're great how you are, but don't you want a male, like, counterpart, like, in your life? Like, why do I need a male sibling, right? You should, I should still be great even if I had a female sibling. But anyway, um, so in my culture and in my line of work, because my firm is in Chinatown and most of our clients are Chinese, sometimes they're like, oh, she seems a little young. She seems this, like is there a guy that could help me out and you know it does hurt and my rule is also don't cry at work or at least take it to the bathroom so no one can see it um the thing is i can't change how who i am i'm always gonna be a female i'm gonna have kind of a baby face but like pravina said push back it's like i deserve to be there and I need to make it okay for my younger female coworkers to know when to speak up when a client is mistreating them. Um, they need to know what the boundaries are and I have to almost be like the big sister and be a little more vocal so they see me standing up when I'm facing an injustice because of my gender or my ethnicity. Um, also, sometimes we have some like non-Chinese clients come and they feel like, oh, we're going to Chinatown, so we're going to kind of like talk down to you because we think your English isn't good. But I'm like, I was born here and I also speak a few languages. Actually, most of our employees do. We're fluent in at least two dialects of Chinese, English, and then maybe we picked up something else at school, maybe French or Spanish. So we're like, really? I don't think that, that we understand sarcasm in multiple languages. So um yeah these kind of struggles stay with you but it's how you decide to handle it that will make your life different so it's like when i started standing up for myself i had to be okay with the 
results. So when you stand up for yourself, it's not going to make everyone happy. But if someone's going to be unhappy because they started something, I think it should be them and not me, especially if I didn't do something wrong. So um, I try to remind myself that and my peers, just so we can all be happier together. <laughs> I love what both of you guys noted in terms of pushing back. Um, and we actually have a question in the chat that directly relates to this. So I'm just going to ask. Oh, hi, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, it's from Caitlin and she says, what's the best way to stand up for ourselves and not be a push and not be a pushover without being disrespectful? I mean, I think uh, it's the golden rule, treat people the way you want to be treated, but I think you just tell them what you want, right? I think people aren't mind readers, right? And and so there's two different sets. I always say this. Some people intentionally do things, so we'll put them to a side, and some people in unintentionally do it, right? They don't mean to, they're not, it's the unconscious mm -hmm. bias, right? Um, so I'm, I'm Indian, as I said, uh, I was born and raised here. My favorite question, like, especially from uh, people is, what what are you and i always want to say i'm a human born on earth so i don't understand this question but i realize what people are trying to get is what your ethnicity is now if someone's open about it and trying to tell me i'm like hey you know i'm indian by descent um but you know a better way to ask that question is like what ethnicity are you you know not like oh you don't belong here right and then you get the other people who are like i'm gonna keep asking you this question until you tell me the answer and so I keep going, well, I was born in Virginia. I'm from Jersey. I don't, I don't know. Where's your parents from? They're from the United States because they're both U.S. citizens. Where's your grandparents from? My grandmother's Canadian. So we can play this game. And I thought, I'm like, Let, we can play this game, but you're not going to get the answer you want. And they're like, I know you're something. And I'm like, are you trying to say I'm Indian? And they'll say yes. And I go, see, sir or ma'am. It's usually a sir, though. Uh, just because I was my ethnicity is Indian does not make me not an American, right? I go, so I get what you're trying to say. I bet you, you have ethnicity that is not um, Native American uh, or are you Native American? And usually they're like, oh, but I wasn't rude. I was just like, I'm gonna play the game with you. And I think a lot of it is if a person's coming from a genuine curiosity, doesn't understand and is unintentionally doing it, there's a nice way to tell them like, hey, you're offending me, right? I know you're not trying to, but you're offending me. And saying those words is okay. So when you get the belligerent people that your word offense and that you've got to sit there and go, almost play them at their own game, go, really, where are you from? Cause you don't look like you're around from here either. You know, and then they're gonna be like, oh, I'm, 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 really? You, you, you were born of the Lenape tribe? That's amazing, you must be the last Mohican, right? And then they're like, wait, that's not, that's not what I meant. And you're like, but that's, you know, I use humor a lot because to diffuse the situation because there is a way to do it nicely and i don't think you know sometimes holding a mirror up to someone's face they get very angry and then there's just people you're never going to reason with and my philosophy is like you're not gonna you're gonna always be there i'm not going to change you so i don't really need to deal with you other than the small box that we have to deal with and most of those most of the time it's very minimal yeah like a lot of times when i try to diffuse a situation i often have to step in for the staff when something's going on i like to give the person a benefit of doubt and i might ask them like i'm sorry i didn't hear you clearly the first time can you repeat this so i fully understand where you're coming from and then i let them kind of talk if they're being you, you can tell where their sentiments lie so if they're being a little unsavory it'll come out and like two seconds and then that's how I'll gauge how to direct my answer but if the person misspoke and maybe I misunderstood I don't want to escalate this unless I really have to so I think um you can still stand up for yourself but just confirm it before you drop the hammer <laughs> Okay, I think um, Betty might have stepped away for a minute, so we're going to... Oh, I'm back, I'm back. I'm okay, back. that's sorry. <laughs> You're okay. I You're did. Okay. I was just trying to put him to bed. <laughs> I'm sorry. So what was... Um, I never answered about the, uh, being a woman. Okay, so uh, obviously in the tech world, all my counterparts were male. Uh, the journey was not easy. Um, I remember uh, even at at and when I worked in the Middle East, my boss, Marty Gupta, told me one day that women should be home cleaning, having babies, 
and what was I doing in this role? So, um, you know, that was kind of my life uh, from the beginning. But um, so what I did is I just moved forward. I ignored him. I showed him that I was better than his my male counterparts, uh, especially as a woman of color. So we need to have a rightful seat at the table uh, and don't accept the crumbs. We need to eat the meat, too. So uh, what I did is I just you know, made sure that nobody could ever say, oh, she's just moving up or or uh, because of uh, of my gender. Uh, and obviously in your own company, it becomes challenging when you're going to customers. So um, I think that, um, you know, what I do is, uh, again, I get involved in organizations. I uh, get involved on boards. Uh, I really need to show that women in technology can do amazing things. And I proved it time and time again. So uh, I think it's just, um, you know, we just need to be uh, confident in ourselves and don't ever let anyone say that there's something that you cannot do. And now we're proving it more and more every day. So was there another question that I missed? Yeah, there was a question coming off of that, like branching off of that. Um, so what's the best way, and this is an audience question, so what's the best way to stand up for ourselves and not be a pushover without being disrespectful? Um, I think that uh, um, being, uh, being confident and like you said, not being disrespectful. Uh, you know, there are some, it's okay to say no. There are some customers today that I choose not to do business with, right? Because they are arrogant, because they um, don't treat us right. So I'd rather say no, um, rather than getting into uh, in, into some, some conflict, right? Um, but you have to keep pushing because no doesn't mean no. It just means new opportunities, right? So seek those new opportunities. Um, I always tell folks, you know, and it's very discouraging when you get no all the time, um, but, we, I just keep moving forward and I always tell them, I'm going to gently um, send you an email maybe every other month just to get on your calendar because especially um, in the world that I'm in as a supply, as a, a diverse company, you have to go through a certain door, right? It's the diversity door. And sometimes they are gatekeepers. <laughs> that means they don't let you in, okay? And their job is to block and tackle. So our job is to nicely say, can you sh tell me who the right person would be? Um, this is what we do. So you got to uh, constantly, you know, because they're bombarded with companies like mine all the time. So they have hundreds of emails. So I know that I'm not going to come to the top, but that's why you have to keep pursuing it. Eventually they'll say, oh yeah, I did come across something I thought about you. And that's what really happened in many cases recently. So um, I, I think that, uh, be nice and and um, you know pursuing. Don't don't just do it once and expect a call. You have to keep pursuing until um, they either say no. There's no way. I don't need your box. I don't need your service. Um, but um, and I think that's the best way to do it. And I never I'm never disrespectful. I choose um, to then walk away. Really amazing insights. Um, so let's switch gears to another topic. Um, you know, a lot of the times when people graduate, they don't end up working in the field that they actually studied in college. And there are even some business leaders, you know, these um, great business leaders, these amazing CEOs that are proponents of not getting a college education. So looking at where you are now, how important do you think your college experience was to getting you there? And this is for all of you. All right, I'll start. Uh, Miss Betty and Aaron have started, <laughs> so I'll, I'll take this one. Um, I will tell you, uh, so I'm very programmed that uh, education is very important, so it would totally go against everything I'm culturally to say it isn't. But uh, I, I will tell you, my experiences have probably helped a lot. I, I always tell, so, um, you know, I went to, to Penn State undergrad. I did that. Uh, it got me my first job. And when I went into investment banking and even some of the uh, other things, executive programs, everybody has an MBA. So my MBA is from Seton Hall and I, I worked 
uh, at, you know, I worked during the day and did my classes at night. And I will tell you, it's the stepping stones to getting you in the door sometimes because it's the easiest thing for someone to say, you don't have that credential, you don't need to be in this room. And it's not where you went, it's how you utilize it, right? Like the time that you spent. And I think that's, um, it was, I found it interesting. All three of us worked and did our degrees at the same time. It just shows you how dedicated and it's because it's it's the easiest thing for someone to say, you don't have this, you don't need to be here. And so it's one way to get over that hurdle. And so I think an education and the credentials are important because A, it kind of says, hey, I did the hard work. I, I belong in this room too, but also allows you to say, that's not an excuse you can use. So um, I'm a big proponent of education, but again, my background is going to be that way. And I get people like I, I know, like, you know, they talk about these guys went to Harvard and these tech guys. But I want you to notice that all the tech guys who went to Harvard and decided all white guys who hang out in their you know garages, right? They're, you never hear about the Asian woman or the Hispanic woman, because if we don't have it, it's the easiest thing to shut the door in our face. So I think you have to think of it from that perspective, too. Spot on. I think for my field, it's crucial to study accounting at some point uh, before you start dabbling in that. So I didn't really have the option not to go to school. But I think it's definitely a case by case situation. It depends what field you're going into. So for like tech, those people were like creating things in their head. So no one was teaching them because they came up with it. So thank you for Gmail. <laughs> but um, for myself, I think, like Pravina said, it's like if you don't have it, they try to take it away from you. And one of my goals is that I want all the letters after my name to be longer than my name. I only have seven letters. So right now I have the MBA going for the master's in accounting and then my CPA. So I'm, I'm almost there. But it's very true. It's just like if you don't have it, that's the first thing people look at. They don't look at what you have. They look at what you don't have. So it really depends on what field you go into. And depending on that, then you can kind of see if school was necessary or not. I think that maybe people don't need a traditional degree, but they always have to strive to learn and keep on growing. So maybe that could be trade school or maybe that could be certificates or even just learning a new skill on YouTube. If you put in the time and the work, it's fine. Like another thing that I like to dedicate my time into is like weightlifting because you can gauge like, did I get stronger? Did I get faster? You need things that you can actually have a tangible sense. Like, did I improve? Did I learn more? And if you have that thirst to keep on learning and improving yourself, if that's like physical or mental, you're already going the right direction. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like, you need to keep school. You just have to keep learning. And I, I, I echo what everyone said. I think um, college didn't help me get to be an entrepreneur. I think it was more my uh, background in working in corporate America that really gave me uh, the ability to do what I do. But um, uh, I agree, it's an easy way to shut the door on you. Um, you know, and I, when I was working at uh, AT and T, most of um, um, they were all. And Harvard graduates, um, uh, Thunderbird, which is a big international school in Arizona, uh, Princeton, you know, so they had all the Ivy Leagues and that was kind of the mantra, MTA, you know, and I was like, you know, my boss said, uh, how are you going to compete with these people? You got to get a degree. And I agree. So, uh, so you do it because you have to. Um, but I, I like, like Aaron said, the trades are now in high demand. There is such a lack of um, uh, skills and lack of um, uh, technicians in the trades, and you know some, and especially if you're a woman and you get into it, like welding, bead welding. There's tons of money for that. So, um, so there are things, and and by the way, that opens the door because there's not that many. So um, the trade is a way to pursue potential careers in the future. But um, I echo what P Pravina and Aaron said.
Thank you so much for your responses. So we're coming close to 8 p.m. and this is going to be our last question for you. Then we're going to turn over to the audience for some Q&A. So there are a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs, a lot of whom might be on this call right now, who think that because of their background or lack of representation, success is not something that is really in the cards for them. Considering that you all come from di different backgrounds, even different countries, what would you, what would be your advice for that budding entrepreneur? Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to start first because I have to go burp my grandson. <laughs> so I, I, I read a book. It's called uh, Blue Ocean, Red Ocean. Um, and I love it because I think you have to create your own destiny. So you want to create your own blue ocean. So the blue ocean is where there are less competitors. It's like uh, when Lyft came out, that was a blue ocean. Uh, Cirque du Soleil, that's a blue ocean because circuses were circus, but Cirque du Soleil did something totally different. So you want to be there first and you want to create your own destiny and create something that not everybody's swimming in, and that's the red ocean. The red ocean is where all the fishes are, your competitors are there. That's where you will get eaten up because it's cutthroat and low margins. So swim in the blue ocean and create your own destiny, but beware of the blue oceans can turn red very quickly. Um, okay, I, I'll, I'll go. Um, or you can hear my child crying in the background too, so it'll be fun music to all of you. Um, I, you know, I gotta say, you've got to figure, I, I, I liked what she said, blue ocean, red ocean. I agree. You've got to really believe in yourself. And I think, you know, we all talk about representation. Somebody has got to be the first to get us the representation. So it, if it's you, that's amazing, right? Like, I think, you know, we look for people who look like us all the time, but sometimes you're not going to find it, but you can find a kindred spirit, but you could be the first who's, you know, trailblazing and making sure that we bring more to the table. And like I said, in, in the government, it's one of those things where it's very easy to say the program fits this box and, you know, we do well. And I always tell my team, I'm like, if we're doing so well, we shouldn't have a problem. You really shouldn't need me to have to guarantee a loan because everybody should just be getting loans off the street, right? And so I think it's the point of the matter is getting to the table and fighting to get there. Uh, even if you're the first one, you're opening the pathways for others. And so, I mean, if you look at, you know, I still look, if you look at the Fortune 500, there are not that many CEO, women CEOs. We talk about it all the time. And they have the same education, they have the same thing. But what you are seeing is a lot of women, the next tier of women bringing the next tier of women up because, you know, it should be just as equal. And so I think if you're find, trying to find a role model to be inspired, there's a lot of people in history who can inspire you, but you might be the one who can make history and inspire other folks. So believing in yourself, even when everybody tells you you can't, is actually, you know, you got to be your own drummer and realize that there may not be the representation. You may be it. <laughs> Yeah, I 100% agree. I was going to echo something similar to that. So it's like, I know sometimes things look difficult because there's a lack of representation. But if we look at our cultural norms for your ethnicity, like for me, I'm Chinese, much like Karina, because she's Indian. It's like my choices were like, be an accountant, go into medicine, or maybe become a lawyer. And, you know, I did follow my father's footsteps, but it's a little different because we own our own business. And because I'm Chinese, I wanted to at least give it a go because otherwise my dad's hard work would just be gone. Because, I mean, you guys are at Seton Hall and in business, you know that we learn it's the first generation is the hardest for the business to succeed. And after the first generation is when you see if the business will continue or not, right? So that kind of falls on my shoulders because I'm in that little crossroad right there. But if you look at a lot of the movies that are out there right now, uh, the Asian community is cranking out all of these talented people. Like we have Aquafina, Henry Golding, um, Simu Liu. And they didn't take the traditional role. And they were like, no actors look like me in American media. And if they shied away from their dreams, we wouldn't have those movies right now. And maybe little kids watching these movies wouldn't have that superhero to look up to. And we could be that superhero for someone, especially if we are fortunate enough to 
start our own business, go to grad school, or help someone else. And I think my father really understood that when he started his firm. Like he went through Deloitte, he started his own accounting firm. And look at where our company is situated. We're in the heart of Chinatown. And we service mostly immigrants who didn't speak English when they first came here. And we're helping those people realize their dreams, right? Some of them are opening restaurants to bring recipes from China over here because they missed home and they wanted to share a bit of home with the people here. Other people went on to open huge hotels that are part of very reputable franchises around the world. And we're a part of that. So even though we went the accounting route, we're a part of all these people's dreams. And you can be too, depending on how you pave your career. And if you're fortunate enough to do well, it's our job to pay it forward. And I think right now I'm trying my best to learn the most, but also pay it forward to those who maybe need my help and maybe can you strengthen me. So at the end of the day, you just try your best and maybe you could help make it easier for somebody else. Are there any questions from the audience? I think we stunned them into silence. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, this was very good. Uh, yeah. And uh, Praveena and Erin, amazing, amazing young ladies. Um, very proud of you. And Praveena, I think, you know, the manufacturing thing is spot on um, because that's what we were talking about uh, with uh, NMSDC today with the Kellogg School of Business, that we need to create uh, more manufacturing hubs here in the U.S. because the supply chain is going to kill us and it's going to get worse before it gets better. So yeah. there is a no, question I, there. Uh, what's the best way to stand up for ourselves? To, that was that answer yeah that one was already asked but okay. uh professor sherrick actually came up with another question which is who inspires you um so if whoever wants to give the responses who inspires me yes um today uh, or in the past so in the past it was my mother uh, i think she was uh she was a rock i mean she was a hard worker uh working at factories and um you know she never finished um in Argentina, she never finished um, grammar school, as a matter of fact, but she was a whiz in math. And I think today what inspires me is my employees um, because I see how they're growing. Um, they're able to now buy cars and buy houses and, and start a family that, you know, none of them have college, as a matter of fact, maybe just two of them. And they're amazing engineers, amazing technicians. So I think they inspire me every day to go out and keep hustling. That's a great answer. Um, so mine's also my mother uh, is my insp inspiration. So she's a first generation immigrant. Came here. She was a she was a lawyer. She did amazingly. She even argued in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, she is even to this day still doing pro bono work to help, uh, especially women, uh, uh, especially women who are in, in situations where they don't get representation. So to me, that's where I get that spirit from both my parents actually about giving back and doing well. Um, and how I know that you can do things that's a, like you can do things even though you're the only one in the room and um, every day I have a daughter and I'm a mother later in life and the reason I wanted to be a mother was a because I wanted to give back but she inspires me because I want to make the world you know as corny as it sound a better place for her I don't want her to have to go through half the struggles but she needs to go through some because you don't get you know gets tough if you don't but um, I really want to leave her in a world where she doesn't have to continually, we don't have to count the many, how many women CEOs, we just have to say, yeah, there's another one. And so um, that's, that's, that's what inspires me to keep going and trying to change the world uh, for all of us. Both of my parents really inspire me and and it goes without saying as I'm following in their footsteps and trying to continue both their legacies with improving and just updating our firm. Um, I just think that what my dad has done over 
multiple decades with his company by helping a lot of people who really needed that where others were turning them away. Um, that really inspired me and I want to continue that work because if we don't give back to our own kind, who's going to, right? So it's like, if I can't give back to my own community, I can't expect someone who doesn't understand my community to do something that I myself can't do. And I think I try to live every day like that and not only serving our clients that need our help, I also want to inspire my employees that are younger than myself because they also can carry that to their everyday and help other aspects of, of their life. I love that. That's so inspirational. Oh, <laughs> I had one question that I wanted to ask kind of selfishly <laughs> to Praveena because um, this is for all the aspiring entrepreneurs that are in the crowd, uh, me and Faith, uh, like R1, as already um, Professor Sheck already mentioned. But I really loved how in your background, you know, you've worked with so many entrepreneurs and you've worked in um, a lot of these small business settings and in these corporate settings, these very big business settings as well. And I was just curious, you know, what do you see in your experience as a secret element that makes businesses successful versus not successful, if you do see any like um, specific, you know, thing connecting all of these successful businesses. Uh, you're going to hear some, you're going to hear a little person in the background, but uh, so she's decided. Uh, one, it, I actually, to be honest, the, the businesses that are, are successful and I see it, it's a lot about the people at the helm, right? And how they treat their team teams um i think betty said it perfectly like watching and investing in your teams and how you get there and knowing you're all together it, it is leadership um you know everybody has a great idea and you know th and all that but if you don't know who you are and the passion because being an entrepreneur or owning any business there's ups and downs even these big companies they are ups and downs and if the team isn't at the helm that can make it better um and really trust each other it doesn't happen and i think you know it, and, and the team is more than just one person. It's about making, like I said before, having all those, having everybody compliment each other. And that's a tough thing to do and build uh, because you've got to go through and figure out what you do well and how the operation can go there. But uh, it's people. At the end of the day, you can have like Uber, Lyft. Everybody talks about all these things, but it's the people who built them. And how do you inspire more people to join? And how do you, because if you can't do that, to your own team and, and that's your biggest asset makes it tough and so when we i do we do venture equity investment team is a big factor technology is great but team is a huge factor because if it doesn't work the company will fail no matter how good the technology or even the the market space is thank you faith sorry for cutting you off i don't know if you had a question or any comment no, you're, you're good. I just wanted to remind everyone in the audience, if you do have a question, like, don't be shy, put it in the chat. But I do want to ask, um, and this is for Aaron. Um, so you like currently work in your family business, and that's a very interesting dynamic. Could you expand on maybe your experience so far and how it might make certain things better, worse, or maybe just different than in a, like a non-familial organization? Oh, it's definitely both. There, there was definitely a transition time when I left my last job and started working for my parents. I, I like to call that in my head the dark ages <laughs> because it was definitely a little bit turbulent, um, but it took a little while for us to give a little push, push and pull. And there was a lot of compromising for us to find our groove. And I think we had to look at the bigger picture, right? Is it better for us to always be squabbling or not move forward? Or do we put all our ideas together and make this even better than it is? And I think that it was really difficult for my father. Well, he's not here right now, but it's difficult for him to see his other baby, right? This is the first, I'm the second baby. The business was the first baby. Um, for him to let go of some of it and let me put my imprint on it because I was seeing things that maybe he didn't see. And whatever business you're in, if you're going in with partners or with family, 
it's important to get a different set of eyes on things. I always ask my friends for opinions when I go submit something or I want to pitch an idea. And actually, some of them are in the audience today. So thanks for your support. Um, it's really crucial to find a group, like a good team of friends and people to surround yourself with where you can bounce ideas off of. And I think it took a little while for my family and I to find that groove and we're there. And I think that also took me maturing in my career and, and as an individual where my parents had to see me not as their child, but also as their peer. And that's really jarring for parents, you know, because they raised you, they saw you from, you know, like this to as an adult and it's hard for them to be giving you advice and then suddenly be taking advice from you. But when you prove yourself and they're like, they understand that you care and you've also put skin in the game. And when you find that balance, um, I think things are really good. It make you have that benefit because you can talk about it when you go home. Like you shouldn't always bring things home after work, but we can turn it off, but we also can rely on each other. And if one person is off one day, we kind of compensate for the other. And I think that's a benefit of being in a family business. But to get to that equilibrium or that harmony, there is a lot of friction to reach that point. And that's not for everyone. Yeah. I'm sorry. The question was uh, around um, uh, how do you get, how do you uh, build a successful business? Is that it? Um, it was targeted towards I, uh, Aaron. It was about family business, like the dynamic. But we can also talk about like what led you to start your business. Um, I think that would be another interesting thing. Um, so yeah, so see, I hope I answered your question. Um, it's really good now, but it took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to reach that point where we trusted each other and respected each other's opinions. Um, but now that we're there, it's really, really good. Yes, you definitely answered it. I know I've heard a lot like worse stories, so to see a like a successful example is a great thing. It, it's very challenging. I know a lot of my friends and clients, they also are in a family business situation. I think one benefit for me is that I am an only child, so they only have to fight with one child and not like three. <laughs> but also then they know that I'm always the tiebreaker between them. So I think they take my points a little more seriously. Not that if you have siblings, it discredits that, but then they don't have the power in numbers. They, it's just the three of us. So there's always someone that's going to be the odd one out. And I think that keeps things very objective. So the, um, Velen, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, the, so the, that question was specifically for Aaron. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. We had, we had questions for specifically for, for Pravina and specifically for Aaron. So specifically for you, Betty, um, we wanted to know since you worked in corporate America for 20 years, um, before you started your company, we were wondering what sparked your drive to start your company. Uh, okay, so um, two things. One, when I worked at AT and T, my last job was um, the uh, it's uh, supporting um, uh, AT and T, right? Um, in in Lucent, and that's when I found out about supplier diversity. And I'm like, hmm, well, I'm a Hispanic woman. Uh, what is this thing? And I saw some of the people that were just doing crazy business, getting amazing contracts, and they knew nothing about our industry. And I was like, wow. I and and so. And there was that time frame, 98, where we were right sizing, downsizing, you know, and every day you had to go through these rounds of seeing which employees you were going to let go. And I just I just had enough of that. Um, and uh, that, you know, there was no more respect, like people were just leaving um, because um, we didn't ma make our numbers. So um, I went to my boss and I said, so if I started my own business, uh, I know what where their gaps are. I know what you need would you give me a contract? And they said, if you can get certified as a Hispanic woman and you can launch a business, um, go.
go for it. And if you if I have to compete like everybody else. And so um, obviously as a value added reseller, uh, one contract was like $80 million. So I went to the bank and I said, hey, I got this, this deal. Um, can you loan me the money? And they laughed at me. I mean, I had no balance sheet. So I partnered with a distributor called Annixterm and um, because they were very interested in doing business with AT&T. And so I said, let's start a mentoring protege program. Uh, you be my mentor, I'll be your protege. And so they funded everything. So the first year in 2000, um, we were up to $130 million worth of business, which was amazing. Uh, obviously they made the bulk of it, but um, I got a few percentages, but you know, a few percentages on 130 million is pretty sizable. And so that's how I built my business. And we did that for several years until I was able to get my own office, get my own warehouse. And to this day, we are now uh, 23 years in business and we're still doing a lot of business with Annexter. Now they're Annexter Wesco. So, um, you know, I think because I was true blue, I, you know, they trusted me. Uh, they knew I knew what I was doing. And, um, and so, and I competed like everybody else. And that's how, uh, that's how I launched it. I apologize, but I have a family emergency in the size of a four-year-old who you can probably hear in the background who's decided it's time for bed. Um, but I just want to say, uh, so I'm going to jet out early and I apologize. Um, this no, is I understand. I've been. <laughs> but uh, I, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank and thank you guys. You and go manufacturing. I'll help you. I love that. I. That we'll, we'll connect and Aaron and, and uh, Bela and Faith, it was great. And I really enjoyed meeting you and, I, and all the entrepreneurs out there. Just keep the faith. You guys got it. Right. Thank you, Pavina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We Pavina. are about to wrap up anyways. Um, I don't think I see any more questions in the chat. Um, if there is an audience question out there, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. But yeah, if there isn't, Thank you both, or thank you everyone for being here. Um, I loved our conversation. I was taking notes while you guys were speaking so I could really reflect. And um, yeah, thank you so much for taking your time to be here. I know both of you are very busy, Pravina as well. And I'm so happy I got to, uh, you know, have this conversation and listen to everything you guys had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Bella. And thank you, Faith, for uh, putting on a great, you know, you, you women are going to do amazing things. Um, stick with it. Um, as entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, we have to support each other and lift each other up. So Erin um, and I and Pravina are here to help you any way we can. Erin, it was such a pleasure to meet you. Good luck with your family business. Thank and you, you. you're you gorgeous. And um, yeah, the only thing I was going to tell you that's always better to have other siblings that you can throw in there and like <laughs> let them beat them up. But um, so glad that you're doing so well. Bye, everyone. It was great speaking and meeting with you. Uh, it was really inspiring. And let's keep in touch. Anyone, if you want to reach out, um, my email is available through Professor Shurik. And I hope everyone has a good evening. Thank you. Thank have you. a good evening. Bye-bye. I Thanks. hope you have a beautiful night. Thank you all for coming.